So yeah, I'm, uh, my title is I'm Deloitte's US Chief Data Scientist, which is I think Deloitte's kind of polite euphemism for I'm the oldest surviving data scientist at Deloitte. I've been there since 2001. So I've been doing this since before data science was a meme. But um, these, my, my training, by the way, is in philosophy. I have a PhD in philosophy. So I'm of this older generation of data scientists who, you know, before there were kind of professional training programs for this. We all did these weird backgrounds. We all came from physics or math and a couple of philosophy people. And I became an actuary. I actually entered actuarial science because I imagine that actuarial science was sort of what we now call data science. And I'd actually like to acknowledge my husband, Shantanu Dutta, in the back. Uh, he's a marketing professor at the time at the University of Chicago. And he told me, when you go to work at Allstate, get close to the data. That's going to become really important. And that was the most prescient bit of advice I've, I've had in my entire career. So it's been quite exciting because I've been able to see this kind of um, discipline transform itself from this, this backroom activity kind of like scattered in different pockets. I got my, I cut my teeth on machine learning, what we now call machine learning, at the Allstate Insurance Company's Research Center down the peninsula in Menlo Park. And there are people who have been applying that trade since the 80s. You know, and I joke that our kind of cubicles and computer equipment was mid-century modern. So it's been going on for quite a long time. Um, but now, you know, the last 10 years, it's become like this kind of business trend. And now, sort of as we heard Kathy O'Neill talk about, it's a cultural force and a cultural trend. And so, kind of putting my philosopher's hat on, I like to think, it, it, I find it helpful to kind of think about the sort of like, kind of conceptual development of the field. Where did it come from? So we can better think about where is it going. And before I advance my first slide, think to yourselves, how old do you think data science is? Who do you think the first data scientist is? This is for, hmm? Maybe good, good, good hypothesis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I have a specific claim I'd like to make that the first data scientist is John Tukey. The guy who wrote the book on exploratory data analysis. Uh, I actually put together a, a little anthology of classic readings for our data science community at Deloitte a few years ago, and I just found myself this kind of like section of the readings kind of fell together. The origins of data science at Bell Labs. Because Tukey was a very distinguished statistician, uh, statistics professor, mathematical statistician at Princeton. He was actually the Nate Silver of his time. We're going to have Nate Silver as a keynote tomorrow. He would actually get on the <laughs> Bayesian Shrinkage Show and forecast elections and use Bayesian Shrinkage like in, in real time. The guy was like quite, quite brilliant. But even though he was like a high powered mathematician, he really thought that the culture of statistics needed to change. He wrote a famous essay called We Need More Than Confirmatory. We Need exploratory data analysis. And he actually wrote the book, Exploratory Data Analysis, or EDA, which is a nice kind of like little mid-century modern period piece if you have that on your shelf, this bright orange book with courier font. Um, you know, he, he said that data, uh, exploratory data analysis is not just a collection of techniques, it's not this bundle of like technical techniques, it's like this attitude, it's a flexibility. That's how we should impart this, this kind of attitude. And he also said it's, it's, it's gonna be more than theorem proving in applied math. We're going to need to give people practical computational tools to actually explore what we now call big data sets and to like really do practical work in the real world. So he kind of saw the stuff coming. And ironically, he was a mathematician, but he wanted to kind of bring statistics away from being applied math into what we now call data science. And even though he was you know, an advocate for computers, he didn't use computers. But this famous quote, he's the most quotable statistician ever. I don't think my thoughts are messed up. All right, well, hopefully this will be okay. An approximate answer to the right question is worth a good deal more than an exact answer to an approximate problem. Right? This actually wouldn't be a bad tagline for my whole talk about why they design some human-centered design. That quote, um, that sentiment actually, was the inspiration for one of his colleagues at Bell Labs, John Chambers. Chambers was a protege of Tukey, and he actually wrote a eulogy for Tukey when Tukey passed away. And so that quote from Tukey, that having, you know, uh, an approximate answer to the right question, that's better than an exact answer to the wrong question, right? That was actually the uh, design principle. That was actually the design philosophy that inspired the development of the R software, which was very much supposed to be a tool. Like it was a user-centered design tool that kind of like, gives the data analyst the power to kind of interactively explore data and figure out what's going on. I started using R in 2003. I switched from SAS, and that it, it, it's one of those kind of breakthrough moments in my career when I really felt like I had the power to do what I was supposed to be doing. And, and he also wrote this essay. The same guy, Chambers, who developed the S language, which later became R. Um, he also wrote a really nice essay, which I stumbled across many years ago, called Greater or Lesser Statistics, a Choice for Future Research. He basically said that what he calls greater statistics is anything and everything we can do to, quote, learn from data. Okay, so it's, again, it's not just this kind of, like, set of, like, mathematical techniques. It's this greater field that includes tools and computation. Well, that's not, it's not he's kind of channeling John Tukey's original philosophy. And another one of... Tukey's protégés and Chambers' colleagues at Bell Labs was Bill Cleveland, the guy who wrote the original books on data visualization, 
which is very much human-centered design. He was actually using principles of psychology to kind of understand, like, what is the right aspect ratio for us to kind of like, be able to look at muddy plots? You know, can we create low S curves or like really rough scatter plots to kind of figure out what's going on? Very much like you know, giving the data analyst you know these kind of like tools to kind of figure out what's going on in data. Well, guess what? The same guy who kind of you know followed up Tukey and pioneered the field of data visualization, he wrote his own essay called Data Science, an Action Plan for Expanding the Technical Areas of the Field of Statistics. So that's kind of where data science came from. I think most of us know the popular story that data scientists came from DJ Patel and Jeff Hummerbacher at Cloudera, sort of in the mid-2000s or late 2000s. I, I presume they reinvented it without knowing it, but I just think this kind of like um, kind of intellectual origin of our field is, is, is quite interesting. I mean, so the same group, of, you know, the same lab that gave us the transistor and, you know, Tsuki came up with the word bit, the word software. I mean, the same kind of innovation lab essentially gave us the kind of um, the, the whole notion of data science, one of our first tools, which is the S and the R, so the school computing environment. Um, and then even the, the label data science this, and this idea of data science, it all came from Bell Labs. Uh, this kind of went, this became, I think all this history is forgotten, but, um, and I didn't know all the history until fairly recently. Um, I sort of caught into the term data science like everybody else did when I saw Drew Conway's Venn diagram in 2010. And it's kind of like this collision of, you know, math and domain knowledge and uh, ability to hack with data completely resonated with me, right? I'm an actuary, so my domain expertise is to start, to start with insurance. You know, I know a uh, pretty good amount of math and stats. And for me, the hacking skills is like, you know, SQL and R and things like that. Um, so that was very nice. So that's kind of where things stand. And what I'd like to point out about this is that, yeah, the domain expertise is clearly important, right? If you're going to be an econometrician, an econometrician you want to know some econometric or economics. If you're going to be a, bi a biostatistician at Bristol Myers Squibb, you want to know your biology and genetics and so on. Um, and I think implicit in this is things like communication ability. People kind of give lip service to these things. But if data science is greater statistics, if data science is another way of labeling what Chambers and Tukey meant by greater statistics, what I think we need now is a concept of greater data science. We need to kind of expand the field of data science. And this is kind of what I interpreted Kathy O'Neill to be saying in her talk this morning. We need to um, kind of treat ideas of things like interpretability and ethics and making sure the societal values are included in our solutions, this needs to be baked into the cake. It can't just be defrosted into the cake. In other words, we need to expand the, the very notion of what data science is. That, that's kind of my, my take on where, where we are today. Um, and this is becoming more important because data science is, of, of course, feeding into artificial intelligence. So I work at a consulting firm, so I can run, but I can't hide from industry taglines, unfortunately. And I've seen data science become an industry tagline, and it's been kind of watered down a little bit. AI is, again, like data science. I think it's one of these taglines that's going to stick. It means something different today than what it meant back in the mid-50s when Herb Simon and uh, Marvin Minsky coined the term. And I'll say some more words about that as we go along. But it is, it is here to stay. And I think the most, you know, kind of like harmless definition of artificial intelligence are systems that can do things that are ordinarily associated with human intelligence. You know, a human had to do it before, and now we can have a computer system do it. And by the way, that would, that would apply to an ATM machine. It would apply to robotic process automation. So some human tasks are just, they just need explicit knowledge. You can just document them. You can automate that kind of stuff. We've had that kind of automation for centuries. The, the Jacquard loom is automation, automation in that sense. The Jacquard loom, if you've ever seen a picture of it, it looks like a bunch of punch cards, given where the threads go. Well, now we can kind of automate things that are associated with tacit knowledge, like recognizing faces, or you know, recognizing this is a bouncy red ball not a red light, stop light for a self-driving car, right? Because we have big data. A lot of human knowledge is kind of electronically encoded, so we can use this kind of human knowledge to build AI algorithms. So this is data science, right? Deep learning is regression modeling. Fancy regression modeling is essentially regression modeling. But the point is that it's regression modeling that's gonna have a huge societal impact. This is Andrew Eng, he's kind of a deep learning pioneer, saying that AI is to our upcoming century what electricity was to the past century. It's going to kind of transform industry and transform from the world in ways we don't quite understand yet. So we're in this kind of like pregnant moment when we kind of need to really make sure, you know, I think echoing what Kathy was saying this morning, that we have the right kind of um, um, kind of like uh, ability to kind of like encode um, societal values and not just treat this as pure computer science or pure statistics. So we need greater data science, greater AI. Um, and there are examples of this abound for why we need this, right? Uh, you know, and, so, and what I'd like to explore is that, you know, kind of this idea of human centricity might be a useful organizing principle. Take it or leave it if you don't like it, but I'm, I'm hoping that you'll find it useful. Um, examples of why we need uh, kind of a notion of human centricity. Well, what, 
I, I kind of think that a lot of artificial intelligence threatens to become artificial stupidity, and we're already seeing this around us. So you have people driving their Teslas around, but their Teslas crash because they misinterpret what it means uh, to have an autonomous vehicle, for what it means for the, for the um, vehicle to be in autopilot mode. We see examples of um, uh, algorithms that reflect societal biases. This is a famous example of, a, of an MIT uh, graduate student um, she sat down in front of her friend's computer and the webcam uh, didn't recognize her face, but when she put a white mask over her face, the webcam all, all of a sudden recognized her face. There was, this, uh, there was this, you know, in, what, in statistics we call a sample frame issue, right? If, if, the sample, if the sample that was used to train the deep learning algorithm only contained white faces, guess what? You'll have an algorithm that only, reflect, you know, that only picks up on white face, faces and won't pick up on black faces. So that's artificial stupidity. It's just, it's just you know, kind of, kind of un, 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 unintended consequence. Um, these things can even amplify our biases, right? I mean, you know, we, we've seen that social media um, can be powered by algorithms that collaboratively filter news and opinions. And collaborative filtering might be really great for helping select movies or books. But if you collaboratively filter movies and opinions, we, you know, there's a lot of psychological research suggesting that that will um, actually amplify um, a psychological phenomenon known as group polarization. You know, if you get a bunch of people in Berkeley to deliberate about something, their kind of modal opinion will, will be farther to the left than when they started, and then now in Orange County. That's just human psychology, and if we pour kind of collaborative filtering news opinion on, on this, it's like pouring gasoline on, on, on the flame. Um, and, and we even see suggestions, and this has been disputed, this is Gene Twenge's article, that, um, that AI-enabled social media uh, platforms can, can lead to addiction and depression, fear missing out, and so on. So these are all senses in which, here's the tagline of my talk, smart technologies are unlikely to engender smart outcomes unless they're designed to promote smart adoption on the part of human end users. In other words, effective artificial intelligence needs human-centered design. That, that, that's what I'd like to argue here. I, and I just find this, I, I kind of came across this idea of human centricity, to be honest with you, by reading the behavioral economics literature. And I'll have some more stuff to say about behavioral economics as, as I go along. Um, and, I, and I'll just make one nod to Kathy O'Neill. I, really I really admire her as a thinker and as a pioneer. Um, I've read her blog since 2012. Uh, one thing I'll just say is that this idea of human centricity is a hypothesis I have. I think it's kind of close in conceptual space to the idea of ethics. She was talking about ethics. So big principle, there are two big principles of ethics that aren't always compatible. One is kind of utilitarianism, right? We want to have like the best outcome for the most people most of the time. It's kind of like the economic notion of ethics. The second is you don't treat people as means to an end. You treat people as ends in themselves. You don't violate human autonomy, right? You, 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 you kind of obey human autonomy. You respect human autonomy as like a fundamental right. And the idea of kind of like, that's more of the Kantian tradition of ethics. To me, that seems awfully close to this idea of human centricity. We really want to think about what are the effects this is going to have on the end users and on the larger society. And so maybe I could expand this to human-centered design and maybe society, society, societal-centered design. All right, this is sounding awfully high level. I hope it doesn't sound too flaky, but I'm going to kind of ground it um, starting now. This has been the kind of expansive part. I'm going to kind of contract a little bit. By human-centered design, I, I, I'm actually pointing to um, an established body of theory. Um, or practice. How many of you guys have read the book or heard of Don Norman? Good, about half. Okay, so he wrote the classic book, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, I actually gave a talk with Don here in San Francisco about a month ago. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, he's 82 years old and he's still active. He leads the design lab at UC San Diego. He was the founder of the first cognitive science department at UC San Diego back in the 50s. A guy named Jeff Hinton was part of that department back in the day. So and he knew John Tukey. So they, they, you know, these people are all re related in these fascinating ways. On page like nine or something of this classic book, The Design of Everyday Things, he said, the problems with the designs of most engineers is they're too logical. We need to accept human behavior the way it is, not the way we wish it would be, all right? And what I'm kind of saying is that we don't want data science, in my opinion, a lot of data science, if you go to a lot of these conferences, it kind of, I feel like we're moving in more of a computer science direction and actually less of a social sciences direction. And I'm almost saying we need to go more, we need to kind of go along on the kind of social science end of, end of things. Um, we don't want to forget this. We don't want to become like, we don't want to become like the designers that build things that have feature like this. Like what if, what if, what if this clicker had the back arrow key was on the right side? I'd get confused all the time, right? That would be an example of a device that goes against the grain of human psychology. Or have you ever come across a door where you, you, you have to push to get out the way that guy just did but has a pull handle? And you pull and you get really embarrassed? That, that's an example of a very simple technology that you need an instruction manual to use, right? It needs a little push sign to tell you, oh, you have to push this door. 
because the, the door is not designed, you know, to go with the grain of human psychology. Or would you rather have a stove with the knobs arranged in the um, same configuration as the burners, or in just some random configuration to look nice? Because the guys at you know Mealy or Hans Grohe decided that's that's what looks nice. So this is not designed in the sense of style. It's designed in the sense of you know understanding human psychology, reflecting human psychology in your product. Or have you ever been in a hotel room and you just fail the IQ test? You can't figure out how to use the TV remote control to just like a stream YouTube video. Right? So these are all examples where um, where. It, where, where the engineers are not thinking like designers, they're just thinking like engineers. The, you know, they're not designing things to go to human human psychology. And what I'd like to explore is that, and maybe this is something we need to develop, is there an analogous set of kind of tools and techniques that we can use to create kind of human-centered algorithms. Now, I, I've, again, very grandiose. This could be a very long discussion. It could be like a two-day seminar. But I have two very kind of humble, specific examples I'm going to use to illustrate what I'm talking about from my own experience as a consultant. And so, you know, we, I'm saying we want to kind of design algorithms, design data products, design AI products to go with the grain of human psychology. Well, there's a famous book about human psychology that was written under 10 years ago. It actually came out in 2010. Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Who's read Thinking Fast and Slow? Excellent. Probably the same group of people. I think it is. Um, I'm going to think, I'm going to go slow and then fast, literally. I'm going to kind of go through the thinking slow thing, and then maybe in two minutes at the end, I'll, I'll talk fast about thinking fast and talk about how I've, I've, I've been working with some folks at Deloitte to bring uh, nudge theory into our data science practice. All right? But that, that's the idea. So there are two different types of mental operations, right? Thinking slow is what Kahneman calls system two thinking. And that's kind of like thinking like an actuary or thinking like Mr. Spock. Should I give this business the loan? Should I admit this student versus that student to graduate school? Should I hire this person rather than that person to work at um, Domino Data Labs? And we've the head of people operations from Domino back there. So those are all kind of thinking slow decisions. And intuitively, or actually before, when Kahneman and Tversky started their research back in the day, the kind of prevailing opinion in psychology was that people make decisions like that they're kind of acting like little Bayesian rational updaters in their brains. They're building little regression models in their brains. That was kind of like, they're, they're staticky, there's like, you know, very lot of noise involved because we're not really good at all this kind of stuff, but in principle, that's what's going on. And if you had enough people together making these decisions, the little st staticky bits of noise would kind of cancel out and you get to the true answer. And then Kahneman and Tversky kind of like discovered through this like series of path-breaking experiments, that's actually not at all what's going on in our brains. When we make decisions, what we're doing is we're telling stories that make narrative coherence, but very often they don't make logical or statistical coherence, right? So if you, if you talk about Linda, you know, this woman who's like an undergrad at Berkeley and she was active in the feminist movement, she did all these anti-nuclear campaigns, what's more likely now, 10 years later? Linda is, uh, you know, working as a bank teller or Linda is a radical feminist who's working as a bank teller? And most people who are, you know, who were polled like kind of diversity 90% said it's more likely that she's a feminist bank teller. Because that makes more narrative coherence. But you guys are all thinking slow. You're all data scientists. and you're, you, you would not get fooled by this, chant, you know, I'm, I'm presuming, because you're thinking like data scientists here at a data science conference. And you all realize that the set of feminist bank tellers is a subset of the set of bank tellers. So that's like a really simple kind of killer example. It actually was recounted at the end of Michael Lewis's new book, The Undoing Project. They, they, they just want to kind of like point, you know, prove this to people once and for all. And even, when, even they were surprised by that, that Linda result. I mean, it was like a face palm moment for these guys. But that's an example of how when we make decisions, like a hiring decision, for example, you can imagine hiring Linda for a job, right? And maybe she's up against Greg, or Lakeisha, or Jamal, right? Do these little narrative coherent stories influence our decisions in ways we don't even know, right? So that's the idea, that when we make decisions, we're not doing Bayesian rationality, building regression models in our mind. We're not doing statistical optimal stuff. Rather, we're, we're telling narratively coherent stories that aren't necessarily statistically coherent. And that's great. That enables us to, to survive when we're kind of like in the savannah. But it's not so great when we're supposed to put on suits and make decisions in, um, in, in the business room. So that's, um, think, that's the idea of thinking fast and slow um, in my elevator speech version. So thinking slow. Um, so here is a specific um, set of examples. My, as I mentioned, my first data science project was at Allstate back in the, <clears throat> a while ago. Um, I built Allstate's first credit scoring model. All right? And if you think about it, things like building credit scoring models to kind of automatically decide who gets the loan or not, or I was using it at Allstate for improving Allstate's rating plan. 
Um, you know, how much do we charge people for insurance? Do we even sell this person insurance or not? There was a time when that was made by human experts. But, you know, insurance and banks are the earliest examples where we took decisions that used to be made by human experts and turned them into algorithms. So these are really kind of literally, you know, by my definition, early examples of artificial intelligence. And in fact, when that famous essay at Oxford University came, came, Oxford University came out years ago, the uh, Fry and Osborne paper, where they claimed that 45% of jobs were going to be lost to automation. Uh, insurance underwriter was number five on the list of jobs most, be, most likely to be lost, right, under, right between watch repairers and mathematical technicians. Um, maybe, um, or maybe it ain't necessarily so. Um, when I came to Deloitte, it was interesting. I was using the exact same thing. How much? 15? Okay, thanks. Yes. I was using the exact same map. I'll pick it up. Thinking, I'll talk fast about thinking slow. Um, <laughs> same math, but for a, a slightly different problem. Can we help commercial insurance underwriters better decide who should we sell insurance to? And if so, how much? And there are fewer businesses to insure in the world than there are cars to insure. So you have fewer rows in your database. And those, ins those companies that you're trying to sell workers' comp or whatever to are all different. Some are, you know, hipster four barrel coffee on Valencia Street, others are construction companies, others are flower shops, others are department stores. They have fewer risk elements in common. So you have fewer columns, right? Yet, what we found was that when we built these regression algorithms, and by the way, it was comical to start, I actually used neural net models. Only because my boss told me to. I thought it was ludicrous, but I did it just to good motions. Early, early example of the right technique on the wrong data. Um, anyway, it was a tangent. Um, it was regression models because we wanted them to be interpretable to some of the points that were made earlier, right? Um, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more. And I was actually conf confused about why this was so valuable to our clients because a lot of the risk elements we risk elements <coughs> we're using were things that are kind of obvious. Historical claims predict future claims. You know, a business that's changed ownership recently is more likely to have a claim than one that hasn't changed ownership recently. These are all things underwriters kind of look at. Um, and I didn't understand it until I read the book Moneyball, again, written by Michael Lewis. And Michael Lewis, in the Undoing Project, um, he actually pointed out that when he wrote Moneyball, he didn't understand the psychological backdrop of Moneyball. Moneyball was actually the most recent popular story of an old subject in psychology that goes back to the 50s, actually a year before the Dartmouth Conference, where artificial intelligence started. A guy named Paul Neal was a psychology professor at University of Minnesota, and he kicked off this um, discovery, um, which became like a, a decades-long research project called Clinical Versus Actuarial Judgment. And what they found was that when it comes to making medical diagnoses, Neil was a clinical psychologist, and what he found was that simple regression models could outperform clinicians in making diagnoses. Even though the regression models are using the same risk factors, the same symptoms that the clinicians were using, the regression model would just blow the, the clinician out of the water. And then they tried it with, you know, judging, you know, what, what is the quality of this vintage of wine? Who should get admitted to graduate school? You know, which you know which team is going to win the football game? And what they found was that in domain after domain after domain, dozens of domains, there are only a couple of cases where the expert, the kind of clinical judgment maker, the human resources expert, the the, the underwriter, you know, the physician. There are only a couple of cases where the um, the expert could um, could even achieve parity with the algorithm. In most cases, the algorithm was better than the expert. Many years later, the um, psychologists in this bit, Ross said, human judges are not merely worse than optimal regression equations, they're, they're worse than almost any regression equation, right? So that's the idea of clinical versus actuarial judgment. Like Michael Lewis with Moneyball, we stumbled across a case of clinical versus actuarial judgment. So the same math, but instead of using it to automate decisions for, our, for car insurance, which is really not possible, we're using it to help experts make better decisions. It's a different branch of math. So you can kind of see where I'm going with human-centered design, right? Because I'm building I'm building um, regression models. I'm going to skip ahead of a couple of slides. What I, what I basically told our underwriters was that we're not trying to say that the equations are smarter than you. What we're saying is that you with the equations are smarter than you without the equations. So it's not the case that equations are greater than experts in general. Rather, the equations plus experts outperform um, experts. Now, what does this kind of homely or example have to do with this kind of like modern age we're living in? Well, already I think you can kind of imagine, you know, Kathy Neal's example of the recidivism algorithm or that um, algorithm used to, uh, to help call center operators kind of decide who gets, you know, which, which families get visited. We've also built those kinds of models that work. The same kind of models, right? We want to make sure that the people that are using these models kind of understand them. Um, it, it's, it's better to think of these things not as artificial brains, kind of doing these AI calculations and automating decisions. It's better to think of the algorithms as being, in the same way that my eyes are myopic, so I need eyeglasses, Kahneman has taught us that our brains are, are myopic. Our heuristics are biased. 
And so algorithms can use to ameliorate those cognitive biases. They're like eyeglasses for the mind's eye. That's the way I think of algorithms like this. So it's a certain kind of genre of algorithms, but it's different from AI algorithms. We're just kind of taking humans out of the loop for the most part, right? And again, this might seem like very specific, very old fashioned, you know, why we want to talk about this. We're in this brave new world of artificial intelligence here. But you know what? Um, a, things like IBM Watson are based on the same classes of algorithms that we've been using for decades, just, just based on big data. And not to minimize the technical brilliance of this achievement, it's huge. But still, you know, it's, it's data science. Also, I, I had the privilege of interviewing um, an MIT professor named Sandy Pendlin a couple of years ago at an internal event that we had at Deloitte. And he knew Marvin Minsky, you know, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, because they were both at MIT Media Lab and CSAIL. So I just thought I'd ask Sandy, I was interviewing him, what do you think of artificial intelligence? This is like a few years ago when it was still like the beginning of the hype cycle. And he said, it's a little overhyped, but it's going to be an economic blockbuster to be sure. But you know, it's not what Marvin Minsky thought. You know, Minsky was advocating what's called computers can do common sense reasoning. You know, Minsky famously advised Stanley Kubrick when he was doing the movie 2001, because they really thought that by 2001 we'd have sentient computers with common sense, have artificial human brains. Now the tagline AI has come back, but it's not what, it's not what Minsky thought it was going to mean. Sandy said, machines have essentially shown no examples of, of common sense reasoning. Therefore, they're compliments to people. People are actually not so bad at common sense reasoning and empathy and a lot of other, you know, understanding context, understanding societal values. However, people are somewhat lousy at tuning things, keeping exact accounts of stuff. Machines are good at that. That gives the idea there can be a human-machine partnership. Well, that's exactly what I was talking about with these underwriting models or with recidivism models, right? Um, there's a, a wonderful example that was kind of the prequel to IBM Watson on Jeopardy, which is 20 years ago, Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, being beaten by IBM's Deep Blue computer. Um, and Kasparov, later, after he was beaten, created a, helped create a new game of chess called Advanced Chess, which was any team of human chess players could work with any team of any group of computers, and they could just enter as a team of human computers working together. And Kasparov actually found that he was not quite as good at the advanced chess as he was at, at or the original chess. Because what gave him the edge in original chess was pattern recognition, which computers are really, really good at. That's kind of a fool's errand trying to you know, stand up with computers for that. And at one point, there was a global advanced chess competition called freestyle chess, where anybody could enter. And there were grandmasters, and there were supercomputers competing. But the guys who won were these two guys, Zach and Steven, two amateurs from New Hampshire, using three ordinary laptops. And Kasparov later wrote an essay about this in the, in the New York Review of Books. Um, and he said that these guys, these guys who achieve this upset victory, their skill in manipulating and coaching their computers to look deeply into positions effectively counteracted the superior chess understanding of their grandmaster opponents and the greater computational power of the other participants. So a weak human and a machine that have been a process of working together was superior to a strong computer alone, and more remarkably, superior to a strong human machine and inferior process. And again, this completely resonates with my experience doing this stuff at Deloitte. Because like, initially, I framed what I was doing as generalized learning models and neural nets and random forests. I was, I was that guy who was always kind of bragging about the latest technique that I kind of brought to our practice. But what really enabled the success of these projects, it wasn't the sophistication of the algorithm. It was the fact that we were using the right data on the right problem, remember Tupi's quote, but also we helped set up that process of work together. Right? It was humans that are designed for these algorithms. It, the best projects were the ones where we'd actually go on road shows and, and teach our underwriters what these things meant. We gave them a good mental model of what these algorithms were. And that, that's the essence of user-centered design. If you don't have a good mental model of the technology, you don't know when to trust the output. Should I just shut it off? Or what? Yeah, I just won't watch the TV, I'll stream YouTube videos. Well, we gave our, our underwriters a mental model, and we included them, to Kathy Neal's point, early in the process. You know, we'd encode their hypotheses as variables that we could test, right? We would make sure they understood the target variable. We want to make sure that we're not unattended proxy relationships. We understand Simpson's paradox phenomena. We want to make sure that the outcome variable is really appropriate, right? We want to have decision rules and reason code messages to, to handle exceptions. So that's kind of like freestyle decision making. You know, what, you know in, the, in the jurisprudence example, going back to Kahneman, this is an example of not bias but noise, right? This is this famous result that, you know, you know, a bunch of judges make control decisions for a study over a couple of weeks. I think some of you have seen this article. And what they, what they found was that first thing in the morning, people had about a 60% chance of being granted parole. And that ratio, that ratio shrank to about 0 by 10.30 in the morning, spiked up to about 60% again by 10.45, shrank to 0 by 12.30, and so on. There's a soft tooth had to throughout the day. 
So that's not cognitive biases so much as just statistical noise. These are incredibly important decisions these, these clinical experts are making, right, that affect people's lives, but blood sugar levels affect those decisions. You know, because when you get tired and you're low on energy, you might, you, might, you might take an easy default option rather than make a hard decision. So this is like kind of like a common Paul Meadle style case study for why experts need equations. But at the same time, as Kathy Neal points out, right, this is that famous ProPublica result she was talking about earlier, right, that the most widely used recidivism algorithm has a false positive rate that's twice as high for blacks as, as for whites. And furthermore, and, and, and by the way, maybe that's, maybe that's okay. I mean, Kathy alluded to this, but there's been some very interesting theoretical work since that study showing there are different notions of algorithmic fairness that can't simultaneously be satisfied when the overall base rate of recidivism is different. Uh, there's a guy named Avi Feller in uh, Berkeley and Shard Goel, uh, local here at Stanford. They, they, they've done one of those things. And others by John Kleinberg and Sindel Molinatz, and those are really important papers. So there are trade-offs in competing notions of fairness, I think as Kathy was kind of alluding to. So, so you know, human experts don't have it all. Algorithms don't have it all. And the, the Wisconsin Supreme Court actually ruled that algorithms like this, like the you know, North Point algorithm, can be used as, um, I forget what the words were, but they can be used to kind of help influence a decision, but they can't determine a decision. In other words, they can be used as inputs in the judge's decision. But if it's a black box, that's like the remote control that you don't know how to use. You just like, either I accept it or I don't. It's either an oracle or it's just like, you know, it's a little bit like the formula that killed Wall Street, right? The, it, it, you know, the people that build the models don't understand the world. The people that know the world, they don't understand the models, and there's a big disconnect. So we need to treat this as not just like a technical thing, but a socio-technical thing. We need an expanded notion of data science. Um, so what we really need is freestyle decision making. Instead of freestyle chess, it's freestyle decision making, right? We need to have, you know, an ordinary decision maker. It's not a superhuman judge. It shouldn't be a judge trained in computer science. It can be an ordinary algorithm, right? Those guys are using ordinary laptops. These can be like regression models. Maybe they should be even simpler than regression models. Here's um, an essay by Dan Goldstein, the great um, psychologist, student of Gary Gugerenzer, he's now at Microsoft Research, co-authoring with Shara Goel, one of the guys who did that paper, one of the papers on trade-offs and algorithmic fairness. And they're talking about simple rules for complex decisions. I've done this at, at, at work. This, sometimes this is exactly what clients want, right? It's, it's, it's a false uh, assumption to say that big data and more sophisticated machine learning always result in better outcomes. Because what we're trying to do is we're not trying to optimize an algorithm, we're trying to optimize a system of human working with an algorithm. And that requires, again, a notion of psychology. So that's, that's kind of the point I want to make. That's the thinking slow aspect of my talk. Think about this. Um, you know, again, I've, I've kind of like alluded to this point. Models are not the answer. We don't care about algorithmic outputs. We care about outcomes. The models have no benefit, a negative ROI, unless you, unless people take the right decision, make the right actions based on those models. I mean, we, we've built models for underwriters where they didn't involve us in the implementation. I've seen, I, I saw one client where they would give discounts to the good risks and they wouldn't surcharge the bad risks. So they lost money with a good algorithm. And they were like, oops. So that, that's an example of what I call the last mile problem. You know, unless you kind of work out in advance what you're gonna do with the algorithm, the algorithm won't work out, right? So I, I, I've been keenly aware of that for a long time. And I've been, as you can tell, I've been thinking about this kind of behavioral economics, Kahneman, Meal kind of stuff for quite a long time at this point. I read Nudge in 2008 when it came out. Um, it didn't occur to me until a couple of years ago that Nudge can actually be a perfect addition to this notion of expanded greater data science, okay? <laughs> Nudge, by the way, I fell in my chair when I read this, was inspired by that same guy, Don Norman. Thaler and Sunstein got the idea for writing the book Nudge by when they reread Don Norman's classic book, The Design of Everyday Things. What they're saying is that in the same way that Norman is about designing physical devices that go with the brain of human psychology, these guys are like, let's build choice environments that go with the brain of human psychology. If you give people simple retirement options and default them into what we think based on data is a smart choice, they're more likely to save more for retirement. Nancy Hirsch and I have talked about this, former O-Power um, chief scientist. Um, and so what they're saying is like, take all these quirks of human psychology that Danny Ariely and Freakonomics do podcasts about, and let's use those as more than cocktail party fodder. Let's use these as design principles, design elements for smarter decision environments. And what I'd like to say is that there, there's a certain class of problems where nudge is the right way to take actions. Instead of the classical economic approach of resetting the premium, admitting the person to school, slapping them on the wrist. I mean, the classical economics, if you take it seriously, says that the only way to change behavior is to either give people information they didn't have before or set up a set of carrot stick incentives. That's the kind of like Gary Becker view of the world, right? That's their model of the world. 
And that's a fine for economic research, but you don't want to confuse the model of the world, right? Um, Nudge says, no, no, no. There are other ways of changing behavior. Subtle changes in choice environments, like the way you word things, the defaults, putting the healthy foods at the beginning of the cafeteria line rather than the end. That, that's more like a change, you know, telling you in, the, in your hotel room if it says, yeah, most people in your room reuse the towel the next day. That's more likely than an economic incentive to get people to reuse the towels. So it's not a panacea, but there are going to be cases where these small, almost cost-free little tweaks to choice environments have disproportionate impacts on people's behavior. Now, what does this have to do with data science? Well, here's an example. The, the state of New Mexico hired us essentially to, to do an insurance fraud model. That's why I was thinking of it originally. It was unemployment insurance. When you lose your job because you're laid off, you're supposed to log on every week. This is all written down. You, know, you can look it up on the web. There's a few charitable trusts look this up. You're supposed to log on to the web portal every week and say, here's how much money I made last week. I earned $400 driving Uber. Now, you can imagine there's like this kind of honesty issue here or accuracy of reporting issue. And if, they, if, if the state finds a discrepancy downstream, they try to claw back the money from the person who's collecting it before. That's called pay and chase. As you can imagine, it's a very inefficient way of doing, um, uh, you know, of uh, trying to ameliorate improper payments. So they, they said, well, wait, can we use, you know, kind of like web click data and other data about people to kind of like now cast in real time who's more likely to be collecting, be to be collecting the, um, unemployment insurance benefits improperly? Classic, you know, you can call it quote unquote statistical fraud detection kind of problem. Although we were not framing it as fraud, we were really having these very careful conversations with our clients as we were doing this. No, we're not calling it fraud. People just might not understand what they're supposed to do. And more generally, this, what, I was on a brainstorming call with some clients, and we're kind of going through this kind of data science geek out thing, like should we do this ensemble of machine learning, data robot things to achieve the most accurate model. And I said, that's important, that's, we need to confront that, as opposed to a transparent model, like what's appropriate here? And in this case, maybe a black box model is what we want, we want real, real accuracy. But this going to be this huge problem. Think, think about what the problem is. False positives. The overall base rate is low, so even if you have this really powerful classifier, even people in the worst decile, instead of having like a one in 20 chance of collecting benefits properly, maybe it's a one in three chance. That's a good segmentation power model, it's a good technical achievement. But how do you act on that ambiguous situation? If you simply cut off the benefits of people in the worst decile, you're gonna be taking the wrong action two out of three times. It's a little bit like Kathy O'Neill's false positive, false negative thing, which you talked about this morning. So what I suggested is, rather than using the algorithm to shut off benefits, let's use the algorithm to kind of target nudge messages. And I was thinking about some of Dan Ariely's fun little examples. You know, like if there's a coffee canteen or a coffee machine in your canteen in your company, you're supposed to use the honor system and put a quarter in the cup every time you take some coffee. You know, they, they record how much people pay and how much coffee they give away. And then the second week they put this big artistic poster of eyes looking down at you. And they find they collect more money. And the third week they take the poster away and they collect less money. The fourth week they put it back up again. That's an end of one experiment. And that kind of like suggests that priming people, reminding people that most people in their situation do the right thing, or gee, wouldn't you be embarrassed if like your boss walked in and you're like, you know, making this cup of coffee, right? Well, we tried a bunch of nudge um, interviews <coughs> inspired by some of Ariely's research, and I'll tell you, you've read about the replication crisis and multiple hypothesis testing. A lot of what we tried didn't, didn't replicate. Or maybe we didn't do it right, maybe it didn't work in this environment. Interesting conversation for another talk. But one thing did work, a message that said, um, Nine out of ten of your neighbors in Bernalillo County or wherever you live report their earnings accurately. We were able to A-B test that message. We did randomized control trials from the thing about causality people were talking about earlier. And what we found was those targeted nudge messages that essentially cut improper payments in half. So, and, and by the way, in the midst of this project, we didn't know it was going to work that well. Another state rolled out a similar analogous algorithm and they used it to shut off benefits and they ended up on the Rachel Maddow show. Right? <laughs> And again, that's kind of a Kathy O'Neill kind of point, right? So it's not just how we build the algorithm. But again, thinking about the kind of socio-technical system and the way it's used. So that's a thinking fast use of human-centered design, right? It's nudge thinking. So that's the two, part of my, two parts of my talk. So thank you very much. And if anybody has questions, I'll keep hanging out.